Mark 9, 42 through 50 today. Let me start by just reading it. Mark 9, 42 through 50. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your, your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, the, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet uh, to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how you make it salty again. Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, as we look at, these, at, look at this passage here, we pray that the Holy Spirit be working in our hearts to open our eyes to the truths that are here, and they will sink into our minds and become part of how we think and see the world, um, and see the seriousness of causing offenses um, and uh, let an offense rule in our life. We pray that we would learn from these things and that uh, your son would be made much of today. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. So I mentioned last week, this is a difficult passage um, challenge. And uh, you'll notice, too, that uh, there's, if you pay attention to the verse numbers in your Bible, you'll see there's two numbers missing. Um, you notice it goes from 43 to 45, if you have a modern translation, and then from 45 to 47. And uh, this happens multiple times in the New Testament. And you might say, well, why in the world are the, where are the missing verses? What's with the missing verses? And um, it has to do with when, um, well, how do, I, how do I simplify this? Let's just say it was an over, um, overzealous scribe who probably took, not probably, took verse 20, uh, 48, see, where it says, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, and made that verse 44 and made that verse 46. So as he was copying it, we believe what happened is he just added, he's not, he is technically adding to scripture, but he takes the, the truth that's there and just keeps emphasizing it after each verse. And you'll see how it would flow. And if you have an older version of the KJV, you'll see this, where it says uh, in verse 43, it'll say, to the unquenchable fire, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And in the verse 45, uh, thrown into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. They just repeated it multiple mm -hmm. times. But... Um, as they have, as we uh, remember, we've talked about this before. That the closer you can get to the original, it's believed that the more accurate it is. Because as time passes, you get little, uh, you get scribes like this that might put this verse for emphasis here and there. Um, and so, if you get closer and that verse isn't in those original manuscripts, then you make the assumption, well, somebody added that. And so, the newer versions, knowing there's a lot of scholarly work that says that those verses weren't in the original, so they, they take it out, and that's why you have the verses skip, because the KJV had them in there, and that's considered the authorized version. Everybody's used to it, so you don't want to change. I mean, if you memorize verses, you know, verse 45, well, verse 45, and the, if you change the numbers, you know what I mean? The verses would be different, and so to keep it consistent, that's why those verses are missing. Um, they're not really missing. They're just, it's more, we believe that the modern translation is a little more accurate. Um, and, and as you see, there's no change in theology. There's nothing really added. It's just taking and they duplicated something. So I wanted to mention that because that, we talked about that last week. But that doesn't make this passage any more easier because, because here we've got Jesus talking about cutting off hands, feet, and ripping out eyes so you can get into heaven. And what is that all about? Um, and then, and then, if that wasn't challenging enough, verse 49 and 50, um, everyone's going to be salted with fire. Um, have salt in yourself. Be at peace with one another. How, what does, how does that all fit? In? It's just, it was, a, it was a real challenge as I as I dug into this. But I was able uh, through through prayer and just digging into what I do when I find uh, challenges like this. I just go as best I can to the original language and see what those words say and see what's there and what's not there and what's been ch not changed, but how it's translated, see if I'm missing something. And I did find some things that really helped me here. So hopefully I will do my best to not be overly technical, but we will have to get a little technical today to, for you to understand, I believe, what, what it's saying here. Um, well, I don't have to, to explain. I just, I think it's useful for you to see uh, some of this. It'll let you see an aspect and understand it from the standpoint of the, the disciples that were there. Again, we're not in that culture. And uh, some of the words they used are not the words that we used. And you know that words carry baggage, that they, they have emotions and they have understandings of those words. 
Um, like when I was growing up, uh, songs be happy and gay meant something totally different <laughs> than now if we sing the song, you know, that's, it's a different meaning. And, and so uh, th there are different words that have baggage that's carried with them and we avoid certain words because of what they mean. You know what I mean? So yeah, I think it'll help to understand this. And, and as, as I dug into it, like, I got a really clear picture of how God views sin. Um, and I think that's always useful for us to see uh, because we, we're really good at excusing our own sin and being blind to our own sin and not taking it as seriously as God takes it. So to be able to see it as God sees and see how important that is, um, uh, I think is, is, is good. So this is the third lesson. Uh, uh, a couple Sundays ago or three Sundays ago, we did the first lesson, which was faith. That was in 9, 14 through 29. Um, and we learned about that. Then last week we finished the, the passage on humility. Even though it doesn't say humility, I believe it's teaching humility. Then this one is, um, I call the seriousness of sin. And if you have a title in your Bible above verse 42, it might, mine says temptations to sin. But remember that, that's, that those titles are not inspired. And I'll say especially this time because one thing that was a surprise when I looked through this, the word sin doesn't show up a single time in the Greek in all these verses. But yet, you see in verse 42, it uses sin. Uh, 43, it uses sin. 45, it uses sin. And 47, it uses sin. So um, that, was, that was interesting to me. And just to make sure, I went and looked up, um, I went out and did some extensive research on Google for about five minutes and said, what are, the, what are all the Greek words for sin in the New Testament? And um, as I did this, it was, I wanted to share it with you. There's a seven of them, um, but one of them, it's used 221 times in the New Testament. Um, it's hamartia. It's the most common word for sin in the New Testament. It means to miss a mark. You've heard like you miss the mark. God has a mark. You miss it like an archery. It's a word they use in archery. If I'm shooting at the bullseye and I let the string go, the arrow flies and it lands and somebody looks and says, nope, hamartia, miss the mark. That, that, that's the word. And so that's the word that's used most. And all these other words really fit underneath that. So the big category of sin is hamartia. Um, then there's hatema. I hope I'm saying this right. Um, this is a defect. It means you have a moral defect in you. Um, it's used twice, um, but it, it specifically talks about diminishing something which should have been given full measure. So if you rob God of his glory, I'm pushing down his glory to exalt something else, or I'm diminishing something that should be exalted, I'm exalting something that should be diminished, right? And that's, that's sin, or uh, hatema. Um, paraptima is used 21 times. It means to trespass something. So you see no trespassing, right? And you walk right past it. <laughs> It says, don't do this. It's the, the, there's a line in the sand. Really, what is that line for? I'm going to step over here. Well, here's another line. I'm going to step over that one, right? Or it's the thing that says, wet paint, don't touch. And what do we all do? Really, how wet is it? Or, hey, you go to a restaurant, this plate is hot. Don't touch it. What do we do? Well, how hot is it? You know, I mean, it's just, that's, that would be um, paraptima. It's, it's a trespass. It can be willful or ignorant. So I could know that there's a line to cross and I cross it anyway, that's rebellious, right? Or I could not know that there's a line and I cross. So think of a speed limit. Sometimes I turn onto a road and I'm not really sure. Of course, I can't when I'm in Heather's car because it tells me all the time what the speed limit is. But in my old fashioned car that doesn't have that, I turn, I'm like, is this 35? Is it 25? I don't really know. Well, if I'm driving 35 and it's a 25, that would be, that would be proptum. I'd be trespassing something that I didn't know about. Um, then there's agonima. I don't know if I'm saying that right. It's only used once, but it's an offense committed in ignorance. Um, this is a really interesting picture because it's used along the, um, in the Day of Atonement. Everybody familiar with the Day of Atonement? Once a year, the high priest would bring a sacrifice for himself. Or he sacrificed for himself first, but for him and all the people. Um, do you know what kinds of sins he was sacrificing for? This is really instructive, I think. The unknown. The unknown sin. So the idea is, and David said it in Psalms a couple times, forgive me even from my unknown sins, from the sins that I committed in ignorance that I didn't know about. And so once a year, um, during the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go in and he would sacrifice for the unknown sins. And that would be this word here, agonema in, um, in Greek. Um, do you see how sin has so many different facets and how uh, the, the Greek kind of helps us understand? Um, here's another interesting one. Uh, Parakoe, it means to refuse to listen properly. 
In other words, I don't want to hear what you have to say. I'm not listening. <laughs> not listening, la la la, not listening, <laughs> you know, this kind of thing. That's that's really what this is. It's an inattentive, inattentive attitude which results in disobedience. It's a, I know I'm going to disobey, and I don't even want you to tell me what I shouldn't be doing because I'm going to do it anyway. That's that's what this word, it's a very rebellious kind of word. Um, that's used three times. Um, in essence, it's a choose to disobey because I don't have an interest in what's right. That's that's the kind of sin this talks about. Two more, this parabasis. Um, this is a willful transgression of law. It's like, oh yeah? <laughs> Cross over the line. <laughs> willful, rebellious type of sin of crossing the line. So there's another one that says, which means to trespass, but that is, Okay, I guess I'll go across. This one is, a, I'm going to go across. Tell me where the line is. I want to cross it. Right? Mm-hmm. I want to break the law. I want, I'm looking to do that. Breaking the law. Yes. Breaking the law. And then anomia. This is a lawless deed. It shows contempt for the law. So this is somebody who knows what the law is, hates the law, and disobeys it on purpose. It's, I hate God. I hate God's law. I don't want to obey it. Um, it shows contempt for the law, and generally in, um, in, in, in the New Testament, it, sh- it describes a wicked person's iniquity. So this isn't just somebody who's a sinner. This is a very wicked person, and the w- how they sin, is, the, is the, this word is used for that. So seven words for sin found in the New Testament. Can I ask you a yeah, question, go ahead. sir? Uh, when you started, you were talking about the uh, use of sin mm-hmm. in this. And you said, you know, like in verse 42, da 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 da. Can you read? Because in my version, they don't use the word sin at all. Use offense, probably, right? Stumble. Is stumble or offense, is that what they use? Stumble. Yes. Okay. And I'll, I'm going to talk about what that word is because I think this is important to understand. It's a nuance. Now, I don't think it's wrong to put sin there because when we look at the word that he uses, you're doing it to entice somebody to sin. But it's the, it's, it's the difference. If a bird is sin and the bird trap is this word stumble. And he's saying, don't cause to stumble. So don't set a trap. Don't incise somebody, right? It's not the sin itself. It's what you're doing to entice a person to sin. That's what he's telling you to. So he's not addressing the sin. And so with this, these words for sin don't show up in here. But it's translated and says sin because that's what the person is doing. Is I'm, I'm laying a trap so the bird, so the sin will come in and... I have sin. I'm trying to get somebody to sin, or I recognize that something causes me to sin. It's the cause, not the sin would be the effect. The cause would be the stumbling or the trap that you're setting. It makes sense. Yes. And even though it's a, I know I'm splitting hairs, but I think this is an important hair to split here because the word that he uses is a beautiful word. And it's, uh, well, not a beautiful word, but it's a word that helps you understand something even about Jesus, which we're going to see here in a second. Um, what we have here is a word, um, and it, in the passage is a trap, a stumbling block, or an offense. And uh, what I've called this whole, this whole passage, I said four stumbles, four goods, and four punishments. In each one of these four verses, there are four stumbles or causes causing to sin. There are four good things, and there are four punishments. So it's almost as if there's a trap. Don't fall into the trap so you can have the good. If you fall in the trap, there's bad kind of thing is how, is how this is set up. And it's interesting how this all this all fits together. So I'm going to look at each one of those separately. So instead of taking verse 42 and just kind of going through like I normally do, I'm going to take the first part of all these verses and the middle part of all the verses and the last part and explain it. I think it'll it'll help you see. Um, so the word is scandalon. Has anybody heard that word? <laughs> Greek word? Scandalon. Yeah, we do get scandalous from it. Um, but in the Greek, it, um, it literally means an offense or... Um, how would I describe it? It's an offense. It's a setting a trap. It's enticing somebody to do something. It's, um, it's somebody who's offended is scandal on, in essence, to, to, to kind of put it in the, our vernacular. Um, if I'm trapping somebody to do something, that would be I'm setting a scandal on for them, right? I'm basically setting a trap for them to get them to do what I want them to do. That's, that's how it's used. Um, would you be surprised to hear that Jesus himself is a scandal on. Did you know that? I'm going to show you. First, first Peter 2, 7 through 8. You might want to turn to this. It's really, it's really fascinating. Um, and I think it ties back into this. But in 1 Peter 2, 7 through 8, it says it this way. So the honor is for you who believe. And he's talking about what happened before. Now he's going to talk about those who don't believe. But for those who do not believe, then he's doing some quoting here of different Old Testament scripture. The stone that the, rege- the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And in verse 8, and a stone of stumbling 
and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. The rock of offense, um, see Jesus is the, the, build, the stone that the builders rejected, that's Jesus. He became the cornerstone. Then he's going to go on to say, they have a stone of stumbling. Now, that is a, um, it really just means that they are, um, um, they're stubbing their toe against the rock of offense. The, the, the word literally means they stub their toe. So uh, the stone of stumbling is a toe stubbing stone in essence. So you have toe stubbing stone. And then at the end where it says they stumble because they disobey, that's the same word. So they, they stub their toe on the stone. What is the stone? The stone is the rock of offense. That's Jesus Christ is the rock of offense and that's scandal on. Um, and it's a really interesting picture because um, I first heard of this word. I don't know if anybody ever has a long time ago, um, but I dug up this song by Michael Card and it's called Scandal On. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really, uh, it was really interesting. I thought I, yeah, so here's, uh, he sets up two, um, two uh, uh, stories of people that stumbled over Jesus. One, and, he, and, and he, he asked the question really in the next song about what will it take to keep you from Jesus. So I have the stumbling stone, and then he talks about what will it take. So it's kind of reversing what will it take to get you to come to Jesus. So what is it going to take to keep you away? What is that offense that's going to keep you away? And one man, um, I'll just read it. There was a man who was owned by his money. He was as rich as could be, but deep in his heart was a voice that was crying, telling him that he wasn't free. When he questioned the master concerning his problem, the answer took his breath away, for his money had come to be more than his soul forever would stand in his way. That's in uh, Mark 10. We're going to see, we're going to meet that, the rich young ruler, the rich young man. Uh, but then in contrast, and we've already seen this story in Mark, uh, once there was one who was lame in his body, sick in his body and soul, though he did not know all the facts about Jesus, he knew he longed to be whole. So with some of his friends, he went seeking and found him. So many had stood in their way. They tore through the roof and they lowered him down for nothing could keep him away. So here was, so the obstacle was money and a roof. And in one person, that was the stunt, that was the scandal on, that was the stumbling stone they stumbled over. The money meant more than his soul, right? This other person, there's a crowd, there's a roof, um, that's not gonna stand in his way. And remember what Jesus said to him at the very beginning, your sins are forgiven, <laughs> right? Um, probably not what he was looking for, but he probably also knew that that's what he needed. I, we don't know. Um, but that's the, that's the story uh, that when I, was a, when I was younger, I remember, hearing that story, I mean, this uh, song, and then uh, reading through it or listening through it, and the words really meant a lot to me, so it stuck with me. But anyway, um, what Peter is saying here is that Jesus was a rock of offense, and this causes those who don't believe um, to stub their toe. Um, and you see that in the second part of, um, of 1 Peter 2.8, um, they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. So... Um, that's a really deep well we could dive down. We're not going to. <laughs> Someday when we get there, we'll talk about that. But, um, but you can see they stumble because they disobey the word. There was no desire for them to obey. They see Jesus. They know what we're saying when we share the truth. And they're like, no, no. Um, I, I've heard tragically many times people say, no, I, I would have to give up too much to be a Christian. I don't want to be, I don't want to give it up, right? In other words, I'm going to, I know my disobedience. I know this disobedience, but I like that too much. And that's that stone of offense, right? Mm -hmm. They stumble at Jesus um, and they, they, because they disobey the word. So this is this word scandal on. Um, back to Mark 9, this word is used four times. Uh, and in my Bible, I've underlined causes. So that word causes, um, you know, is, is where that, that, that scandal on comes from. Um, that, that's what's used there is scandal on. So whoever scandal ons, Scandalizo, I think, is what is what they use here. It's um, it, and it means to cause an offense or to set a trap. So in verse forty-two, where Jesus speaks of anyone who causes the little children who believe in him to sin or, or to stumble, literally in the Greek it says this: Whoever might cause to stumble one of these little ones believing in me, better is it him for him rather to have a heavy millstone around his neck and to be cast into the sea. That's the, what it literally says in the in the Greek. Um, Notice the little ones are the believing. It's a, um, it's a, um, what do you call it? A participle. Who are they? They're the believing in me ones. So remember, we, the believing in me ones. 
that, that's how you would describe them. They're the believing in me ones, the little ones. Those are the people who are believing in me. They're in the process of believing in me. So these little children that he's talking about here, that's where a couple Sundays ago I talked about, when he talks about little children, this is a, this is a, this is a stand-in or a proxy for the spiritual children, God's children, um, which is each one of us here in this room. So if you cause any one of God's little children to stumble, be better that a millstone be tied around your neck. You see how serious this is. And I, and I think um, I think I heard a pastor speak on this, and he talked about it, the seriousness of sin. This was his the title for this message. Even though sin isn't there, I think we have a tendency to look at sin. We call it cute names, a little white lies, or you know, we share prayer requests, and then we, by under the... Uh, category of sharing prayer requests, I start sharing about all Wink's problems and all the things. And I don't say, let me tell you about Wink. I say, let me have a prayer. Let's pray for Let's Wink. Pray. Let, let me tell you about why Wink needs prayer. <laughs> right? How about uh, venial sins? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's, the, that's a good Catholic, <laughs> Catholic term. But <laughs> sin, um, or I mean, there is a, a philosophy in the Catholic Church of mortal sins, uh, which you can't be forgiven from, and venial sins, which you can be forgiven from. But uh, the Bible teaches that all sins are mortal. And it's that serious. Even the small little white lie, that's enough to condemn you to hell for all eternity. And that that's shocking to us shows us how far apart we, we misunderstand what God's glory is like and how much it shames God's glory for that sin to happen. We, it's just such a chasm between us and what God sees as sin. So when you see this and it's shocking to you, that's a reflection on our hearts. It's a reflection on our hearts of how serious we don't take sin, right? Um, and I'll, I'll, we'll come to that. But anyway, so... Um, so wait, I have yeah, a question. Go ahead. So you think that all sin is the same in God's eyes? No, I think... I don't. No, no. Um, I didn't mean to say that. What I'm saying is that all sin is enough to separate us from God for eternity. Right. Okay. But when it comes to punishment... I believe there, the Bible teaches there is, there are some sins that are worse than others, but they're all bad enough to separate us and send us to hell for all right. eternity. That's what yeah. I mean. Well, Jesus even told the Pharisees, you know, be more tolerable for Sodom than it will be for you right. guys. Because you make pretense for long prayers, but then you're devouring widows' houses, etc. Right. Or what about Judas? Yeah. Right, oh, yeah. what Jesus said about Jesus. Judas, yeah. he said uh, it would have been better for him not to be born because the sin is so great. Since what he's gonna go since ahead. we're kind of on a rabbit trail, anyway, I wanted to talk about since we're gonna be talking about hell and, and I, just to understand the nature of hell versus the lake of fire. Now, okay, so I, I understand hell to be the holding cell, basically, and then the final destination will be the lake of fire. Now, those that believe incorrectly in a temporary hell will use that passage that talks about that God will cast hell into the lake of fire, meaning, oh, see, he's gonna abolish even the hell. And I don't agree. I think it's more terrifying. I think it's probably like the holding cell gets submerged in the lake of fire, so you're both bound and overflowed with fire. But I don't know. I but promise we will cover that. And I will tell you that was another surprise to me. One is that even though it's, I see sin here, it doesn't show up in the Greek. Another one is, do you know that there is no Greek word for hell? Mm -hmm. That hell is an invented English word that showed up in Wycliffe's Bible. Um, and it borrowed from Norse mythology, um, like, like some things uh, that we have that we think um, are out there, like angels having wings. Yeah. The Bible doesn't really say that, but mythologically, we kind of carry that with us. We have that view, or angels singing, things like that. You know, I would challenge people to find that in Scripture. The cherubim have six wings, but the other angels aren't described, right? So we don't know. They may. We don't know. Um, and hell was something to use. There's three or four different terms that Jesus, and we'll, we'll cover what he uses. Well, here he uses Gehenna. And um, I think it's unfortunate that we've put all these very descriptive terms and put it under one category called hell. Because it gets confusing. Like you said, throwing hell into the lake of fire. Well, the lake of fire is hell. It, it, in the it, So it's used yeah. generically in the English, and in, in, when you look at how the Bible is translated in other languages, they don't translate it with one word. That would be using what the English do. They could translate it Gehenna. They translate it um, the uh, Sheol. They translate it um, a Lake of Fire. They're, they're, they use the actual words when they translate it. And hell is something that's invented to help us understand that it's the end place for the wicked, right? That are, don't go to heaven. It's the opposite of the hell. So it made it easier for people to understand, but it's not as descriptive. And then when you see what Gehenna is, it's a very descriptive. And the, when the disciples heard it, 
they would carry all this stuff with them and it would be a very terrifying, horrifying place that they would want to be and they knew about it. And it almost lived in legend at the time uh, when they were there, like a horrible place. You know, kind of like, you know, people sometimes scare their kids about the boogeyman and you gotta stay in bed, there's monsters on your bed, you don't wanna get up and walk out just because the parents wanna go to sleep, right? Um, but this, this, it's this massive legend that had grown at the time of what Gehenna was like. And uh, we know historically from the Bible, it tells us what it was like. And it was a horrible biblical place, let alone a place to be threatened to be thrown for all eternity. Um, and, and I think, unfortunately, hell, as I studied it, I, I realized that this is way more descriptive. And I don't think that it's a literal, I, I do believe it's a literal place. Don't, don't get me wrong, because I know this will be mistaken. But I don't believe that he's saying we're going to throw you into literal Gehenna. I think he's using Gehenna, Lake of Fire, and things like that to describe what it's going to be like because there's no comprehension we can have in our minds of how bad it's going to be. Mm -hmm. So he uses the worst things that we had in, to say this is how bad it's going to be, and that's enough to say I don't want to be there. Yeah, <laughs> right? when you reflect on how horrible it's going to be, it, it reminds you of that other scripture, like knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You know? Right. If you want to get a really good picture of the fear of hell, um, you, can re you can look this up online. Type in um, "sinners in the hands of an angry God" and read that. Read that sermon. That's a good sermon. Yes, yeah. he describes yourself like a, a spider hanging over a flaming fire, and the fire's lapping up against all the, this tiny little web that you're walking across. And you never know when it's going to collapse, and you'll be in all eternity that your life may end. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. And that, that particular sermon sparked revival. It did. Wasn't that the Great Awakening? It was the beginning, it was one of the beginnings of the Great Awakening, yes. Yeah. And by the way, uh, Jonathan Edwards did not preach, he read. Yeah. His sermons were printed in the newspaper the Friday before the Sunday, and he would literally put one hand on the podium like this and read in a monotone his sermons. <laughs> and God moved so strongly uh -huh. over the pre of his preaching by reading. And people would come with their newspapers and they'd follow what he was saying. Oh, but yet, yeah. God and the Holy Spirit moved so strongly. Yeah. Gehenna is a place in Jerusalem where they threw all their refuge. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it burned day and night. It never quenched. Mm. And the worm didn't die. That's right. Because it was always consuming all the stuff that they threw out. Mm. So Gehenna was a, a place that they knew. It was just fire all the time. It was. And when you see how it got there, when you see the story of how it got there, it's really, uh, um, I think it's, it's, it's important to understand. Well, let's see if we can get there, though. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So who is, trip. no, it's okay. Uh, that's, it's, all, it's all good. Because are, these are questions I was asking when I was going through. Um, but who is Jesus speaking to here, right? He's saying, don't set, don't set a trap. Don't entice people to sin. He says, cut off your hand, cut off your foot, cut off, you know, gouge out your eyes. Um, I, I really just asked, you know, um, yeah, basically two questions. You know, who is he speaking to? And is this a literal request? Um, on the literal request, there was a time in the church where some people did take this literally. Um, and if you, it's instructive to see their own writings that after they cut off their hand or gouged out their eye or cut off their foot, that you know what? Their other foot compensated. <laughs> and they sinned just as much, if not more, after they cut this off. So um, it, I, I believe this is hyperbole that Jesus is using. Um, he's, it, and I'll, I'll ask the question like, why did he say this in just a second? But I think it's hyperbole. And you know, hyperbole is a figure of speech. Um, it's something that you say sensationally to make a point. Uh, you know what I mean? It literally, and this is a fi figure of speech, right? You're, you're saying something sensational to get somebody's attention. Because if you say literally what you mean, it doesn't have as much impact as what he talks about. I'll tell you why that is here in a second. Um, probably because he did this probably because we are all comfortable with our sin. We give them comfortable names, which I mentioned. Uh, we don't view sin the same way that God views sin. Um, on the other hand, suffering and physical pain is something we all know about, Right? <laughs> We know when we have to go to the doctor because we have a pain. We know when we have chest pains. We know when we, um, you know, uh, we, we know when people die of cancer. We know when people, you know, we, we know all these things. And that's, that's physical pain. And we know that, right? But Jesus is saying here that even worse than that is sin. But do we really treat sin that way? How many times when a prayer request do we say, pray for, I have a besetting sin and it really is bothering me? Hmm. Never. Never. But in God's eyes, that is way worse than physical pain. 
So I think what Jesus is doing here is using something we understand to show us how much serious something else is. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. We understand pain. We don't really connect very well with sin because we excuse that away. And that is so reflective of our hearts. Mm -hmm. We don't see things the way God sees it. And I think that's why Jesus is using hyperbole to explain something that's very serious. So the next question, oh, and really in essence what he's saying um, is it's better you have physical trauma to you than you to suffer because of your sin, right? We don't approach life that way, but that is what he is saying. Um, so really, which is worse, losing a hand or losing your soul? Mm-hmm. But don't answer mm-hmm. that. But um, the next question is, who is Jesus speaking to? And uh, and I think you'll see even more of the impact that's there. Dad, you had something to say? I want to ask a question. Uh, you might get to it, but I have to leave here in a few minutes. But uh, we're talking about... 40, 44, and 46. Their worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. Of course, that's a quote from Isaiah 66, 24. But in, in 66, 24, it talks about, to, and their worm does not die, and their fire does not die. So that leads me to ask the question, was hell created for those that God knew ahead of time, only for those that God knew ahead of time would not accept him? Um, I will come. I will definitely talk about that, but I'm gonna have to wait till we get to the hell part because well, I, I won't be able to come back off of that once we start. <laughs> this week or next week? Yeah. It should be this week, unless there's lots more questions. I should be able to get to it. I, I promise. You'll have to have coffee with him. I can send him the link. Yeah. I load it on Tuesday morning. Um, but let let me ask because there may be some people saying cutting off my hand. Um, who is Jesus speaking to? I believe here he is speaking to non-believers. I'm gonna back up why I think that. Um, um, cause I have heard sermons where it's preaching to believers and, um, looking back on it, those who preached it that way also believe that you could lose your salvation, which I don't believe. Mm-hmm. So, um, so as somebody who holds to the, what's called the perseverance of the saints or once saved, always saved, you might've heard it said, who is this speaking to? Uh, cause he's speaking to the disciples, right? But, but who are these people representing? Look at the, look at the, um, look at the judgment that comes because you don't do it. And that is hell, right? I think, and that's why I started with, with uh, first Peter, right? Where it talked about those who do not believe stumble over and use this word scandal on. And that's the word that's used here. So I think what you're talking about here are people who are not believers. They're so in love with their disobedience to the word that they won't even cut off their hand to save their soul. And Jesus is saying, this is how serious it is. It's better that you do this then you go into hell for all eternity, um, or it, I'm sorry, he says it's better to do this and go into the kingdom of heaven than to not do it and end up in hell, right? Do you see the, see the decision? So I believe verses 43, 45, and 47, and probably 42, there's some debate on that, but it's all speaking to non-believers. Um, it's speaking to non-believers. But he's talking to his disciples. He is. He is. So he is. who's the non-believers around? I mean, he said he's got the 12 right here. Right. So that I'm kind of confused. Well, I, I, you know, to somebody who's a believer that, you know, if I'm seeing this, I'm realizing how serious sin is. Sin is so bad. It keeps me from hell. And as a believer, how can I have peace in my soul with sin, the same sin that throws people into hell? And I think when he wraps up in 49 and 45, um, he's going to talk about salt losing its saltiness. And we see that there was a kind of salt that was mixed with other minerals. And when you mixed it, it actually was not salty at all. It was worthless. You throw it out. Once sodium chloride, I think that's salt, Mm -hmm. sodium chloride and salt is salt, you don't lose the saltiness of salt unless you mix it with something, unless you dilute it with another mineral. And I think his principle is, look at how bad sin is. It's going to keep people out of the kingdom. It's going to put people in hell. And it's better that this happen, that they... You know, they go in, this is how serious it is. Now I'm going to come here, have salt in yourself, be at peace with one another. Don't pollute your fellowship or the covenant. Salt is like a picture of a covenant. Don't pollute the covenant with sin in your life Mm -hmm. because it will, you'll lose your saltiness. I I think that's the application, but I think he's using this to talk to them is what I I believe. It's how I was able to reconcile it. I'm not writing it in pen. So if you have a better explanation, I'm totally open to listen. So he's telling his believers that they shouldn't, or they should tell people, they should teach people. He's not, he not telling them to tell. I think he's okay. showing them how, I mean, if somebody came to you and said, cut your hand off to go to heaven, it's <laughs> kind of what he says. And if you don't, you go to hell, right? Because you're going to, if your hand is causing you to sin, it's better that your hand come off 
and you go into heaven, mm -hmm. then you keep your hand and you and you go to hell, right? So that would definitely get my antenna. What? Cut off my hand, gouge out my eye, yeah, um, and then the application. Your hand off first. Yeah. <laughs> that that won't help your sin. <laughs> no, but how do you believe that if you're a sinner? You know. So he's telling his disciples that. Yeah, I believe he's telling his disciples okay. and showing them how serious this okay, is. Okay, so that they can pass that on to people to teach them? No, I think it's to emphasize 49 and 50. Okay. But, but gotcha. yes, that, that is something that would stick with me if I'm preaching to show how serious it is. Okay. And um, you see when Peter, Peter was here hearing this, and look at what he used. He used the same word that he used about offenses, and he used it for people who are not believers. Okay. And he was saying that, that the, the stubbing their toe at this offense um, causes them to stay out of the kingdom in essence. And okay. Jesus would emphasize what Peter said and said, that's right. It's better that you cut your foot off so you don't stub your toe. Mm -hmm. So you go into, I mean, you see the, see how it fits. I, I think mm -hmm. it fits together. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that's, that's how I was able to reconcile it. So I believe the specific um, analogy here is to non-believers, but yes, he is talking to believers, mm -hmm. but it's to emphasize what he's going to talk about in 49 to 50. Mm -hmm. And remember what he, they were just doing. They were just arguing about who, arguing about who is the greatest. Yeah. And look at his last, be at peace with one another, <laughs> right? And, and if you look at that verse, he's saying that if you're not at peace, you have, you've lost your saltiness, you've nullified your effectiveness because you have sin in your life. Mm -hmm. then in essence, sin in your life is nullifying in some sense the effectiveness that you're going to have to the world around you. The world looks at our church and sees conflict all the time and nullifies our, our witness in the community, right? That make that makes sense. That's that, that's why I think he's talking about here. So anyway, so um, beautiful things. They say, well, where do you get beautiful? And really, the word uh, kalan is the word used here for better. See where it says better. There's four times it shows better, better, better. Right? Um, it would be better for him. Um, in verse 43, it is better for you. Um, 45 is better for you. 47 is better for you. That word better is kalan, and that is a word which means beautiful or um, it can be better than if you're comparing it to something else. It's good. Um, it's it's not, a, not necessarily a moral good. It's an ascetic good. It's something I can see on the outside. I might say, that shirt looks better on you than the other shirt, right? And I'm not looking at the person I was talking about shirts, but <laughs> that shirt looks better on you than the other shirt. This is what this word is. I can see it. It's obvious to me that that is better than this. There's another word um, called ag Agatha, which uh, you might say, well, I know that. She's a writer, but no. <laughs> Agatha is an internal, intrinsically moral good, which usually in the New Testament is described of God working through me good works. It's the good works. The agathon is the word that's used, which means the moral good that comes from the inside out. And usually it's almost always used of God working through me and the good works come out of his through me, right? That's, that's Agatha. This one is just Kalan. It's something I can see. So this is so the better than that you see there is a beautiful. It's good, um, and it's 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 almost dissonant. In other words, uh, right? Uh, it's better that you cut off your hand. It's good that you cut off your hand. It's beautiful that you cut off your hand to get into the kingdom of God. Again, I think that's to show the contrast of how I view sin and how God views sin. Um, how God views the fellowship in the kingdom of God and the preciousness is there with us and him, that it's better that we enter losing a hand that's more beautiful because the beauty on the other side is so much greater. Do you see this? And again, I think we devalue uh, the beauty that is awaiting us and the hope that is there for us, and we undervalue how bad sin really is in God's eyes because it keeps us from that. Mm -hmm. um, this might be stupid, but is it for today and is it literal? To cut off your hand. No. no, no. What I was saying is um, that th this is hyperbole, and there, are the you know, if you want to use examples, there are people that tried this in the Middle Ages. Monks oh, wow. who separated and they cut out, they gouged out their eyes, and they mm -hmm. they they cut off their you know one foot or one hand and that sort of thing. And they wrote that they sinned just as much, <laughs> if not more. Mm -hmm. Now that their eyes are, they don't have their eyes. They said what they're surrounded with in their in their mind's eye is way worse than what they could see. <laughs> Yeah, um, my eyes would be plucked out by now, my hands, no, my yeah. tongue. Think of something that's really important to you. You'll never see your, your daughter again. Yeah. You know. I mean, I understand what we're, what we're getting at. I do. I just wonder, 
Was it, okay, yeah. This is a call to a radical um, reevaluation of what's important in our lives, Thank I think. Thank you, David. And um, when you look at the examples that Jesus gives, his invitations are radical. Mm -hmm. They're not, hey, just add Jesus. In fact, in the song, Scandal On, there's a, there's a phrase where he says, we've created a, a Jesus who's so easy to step over. <laughs> Oh, really? But Jesus presents something that you must stumble over. And Jesus, in one in Matthew, he says, listen, there are two people in the world. There are people who fall on the rock and are broken and enter into the kingdom. And there are people who don't do that, and the rock falls on them and grinds them to dust. They'll never be put that together. So what, which one are you? And uh, I think we present a Jesus that's too easy to step over, but Jesus presents radical. He says, sell everything that you have. Nobody who looks back is worthy of my kingdom. Uh, the pearl of great price, right? The merchant sold everything. The guy who found the treasure in the fields. That's the picture of salvation. That's, that's the radical call. Mm -hmm. And not that he tells us to do it all. He's, it's a willingness. What's important? And God knows our heart. He can see our heart. Well, that was like that time I asked you, could you really take your kid up there? And you told me yes if you knew it was from Jesus. Right. God gives us the grace to face what he that calls us to do. I pray for myself yeah. your response. Well, um, we're going to end on the four punishments. We don't have enough time to go through all of it, but I did want to unveil a little bit of what, um, a little historical, because I mentioned that hell doesn't show up. And I wanted to show you, I mean, the word hell, there's no word in Greek for hell. Um, some of the words that are used um, is sheol and grave, which you find in the Old Testament, mostly. In the New Testament, there was Hades, Gehenna, and Lake of Fire. So in Greek, that's what you see. Those, those, the Greek and the Hebrew, those are the four words that we is you almost always translated hell in, in the New Testament. The word here is Gehenna. Um, and if you want an interesting study, you can just type in how did the word hell get used in the Bible? And it's really fascinating where it came from. But it's not, it doesn't come from the Greek, the original language. The picture that Jesus used here was Gehenna. Um, and um, in Joshua 15:8 is the first time it's described. It's the Valley of the Son of Hinnom, Hinnom right? And in, in, uh, um, in, uh, in the Jewish language, it's Bar Hinnom, right? Son, Bar is Son, Hinnom is the Son of Hinnom. That's it's the Valley of the Son of Hinnom, that's what it was. In the Aramaic, it was short, it shortened just to Geh and Hinnom, two, two different words, but in Aramaic, they squished it together to Gehinnom, and that's where we get Gehenna. And if you want to look at the story, it is a really notorious valley because Ahaz and Manasseh, they, they um, did uh, worship to Moloch in this valley. And that was a giant, very ugly looking metal statue. And it had that basically put a little newborn baby in and you pull a lever and it would pull, push the baby into the fire. Oh. And so they would stop and it happened so often there was so, and this is right outside of Jerusalem, so people could hear the babies screaming and stuff, oh, that it began to be known as the Valley of Drums, uh, Topheth. Uh, Topheth, Toph means percussion. And uh, so they would actually play drums to drown out the drums or tambourines and things like mm -hmm. that to drown out the, the sound. Wow. You find that in Jeremiah 31, 32. And they, having built the high places at Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it even come to my mind. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will no more be called Topheth, no more a valley of drums, or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter, for they will bury in Topheth, because there is no room elsewhere. And then during Josiah's reign, he tore all this worship down, and he turned it into a place of refuge, where they threw dead bodies, refuge. garbage, Refuse. I thought you said refuse. No, refuse. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and people what? would, it got so full, they would use fire to try to burn it down a little bit. And so fire, would, like like Wink said, was constantly going. You can imagine the smell and the stink. And mm -hmm. But that, that, was, that was a picture of how God viewed, right, um, the idolatry and what happened in that valley. And so for a Jewish, a good Jewish boy <laughs> to be threatened to be thrown into a place filled with garbage and burning and the worm will not die because there's dead matter everywhere. Mm. You can imagine the maggots and just all kinds of stuff. The worm will not die. The maggots are constantly there. And uh, to imagine that their worm will not die. Well, their worms are there everywhere. The fire is everywhere. And you're going to spend all eternity in a place like that. That's what Jesus was saying. Mm. So you can see it's way more graphic than just hell. 
it's there's a lot of suffering than just the fire. There's all this other stuff. And that he said, it's better that you do this. Again, I want to come back to what I think God is showing here of how bad sin really is. And, wow. and if there's anything you walk away from, anything I walk away from, is that I need a more clear picture of how bad sin really is. Because if I view physical pain worse, something I avoid more than sin in my life, something is wrong. Mm. Right? Something, and, and this is a believer saying that something is wrong. Mm. And when I appeal to somebody who's stumbling over Christ, my appeal, I need to present a Christ who can be stumbled over and then plead to them to say, you know, you've got to be willing to do anything because the rewards are so great and the punishment is so great that this is a massive choice that you're making, not just a simple, I don't want Christ in my life. You're, you're, you're asking for something that you would, if, if you had died and I can come and talk to you, I guarantee you, you'd say, I wish I would have listened. I wish I would have listened. <laughs> whatever it takes for us to appeal to them, mm-hmm. and it's whatever they need to do to get into the kingdom, to press into the kingdom, to push and agonizeize the word that's used, that people agonize to get into the kingdom because of what I have to give up that I don't want to give up because I love my sin. But I have to give that up and cut that off the inner. Exactly. When I was on the streets, I ran the streets of Gary, Indiana, Chicago, Illinois, Detroit, Michigan, and I thought, I knew there was a heaven and a hell. I thought, if I can handle the streets, I can handle hell. No. Oh, boy. <laughs> and then... Barb Brewer, my spiritual mentor, Pastor Joe preached a sermon on hell one time, and I wanted to leave, and she made me sit and listen. <laughs> yeah. So this is, it's amazing to me, because I know I can't handle hell, but this is, wow. So um, in closing, with all of this we understand about the Valley of Gehenna and the history um, that they would have understood, and my dad mentioned, and I have this in my notes, Isaiah 66, uh, 23 and 24. It's the last two verses in Isaiah, and you can read it for yourself. It really, think about this. If you know your Isaiah, this is at the end of the new heaven and the new earth. So after there's a new heaven and a new earth, these two verses come in. It says, from new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. Again, there's a new heaven and a new earth. And they, the, who are they? The people that came and worshiped to me, moon to moon, Sabbath to Sabbath. Guess what they will do? They will go out to look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me, for their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Mm-hmm. And, and, and in some way, and I don't fully understand it, but in some way, God gains glory from the punishment that he brings on the people who rejected him. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's, that's why when people say, everybody will give glory to God. The question is, will you benefit from it or not? <laughs> Every knee will bow, and God will get glory. And so it's, wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't it be good? <laughs> uh, can't you see how good it is to choose to have that glory come from you being the people who come to give him praise, not to look on the people who are being punished? I mean, that's a pretty heavy thing to think about for all eternity, that there's going to be smoke. I think in Zechariah it says that smoke will come up from this just constantly. And as a witness. Hell was never created for us. Hell was created for the devil and his minions. Yes. And if you would rather go there than go to heaven, you might. Right. Choice. So let's let's close in prayer because our time is up. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these truths. These are very heavy truths, very um, detailed truths. We pray that um, we would just think on these things. There's a reason why the Holy Spirit led uh, probably Peter to share with Mark uh, to write down and we were holding in our in our hands. And these are literally your words to us, the Holy Spirit um, speaking to us. We pray that we would meditate on them, think about them, um, test, test what I've said today and see if that is truly what the scripture says. And if it is, then what should we do about it? And um, pray that it would uh, change our view of sin. Um, pray that you would just give us a, a, a more ominous and real view of what sin really is in your eyes. Help us to see things the way you see them. Uh, conform us to the image of your son. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.